Today is January 26, 2021, and my guest is John Cochran of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. This is John's sixth appearance on Econ Talk. He was last here in September of 2016 talking about economic growth and changing the policy debate. I want to thank listeners who voted in our survey of your favorite episodes of 2020. That survey is now closed. Results coming soon. John, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's a pleasure to be back anytime, Russ. Our topic for today is vaccines and other issues surrounding the pandemic that are related to pricing and supply and demand. Uh, you bravely argue that we should have taken and should in the future take a more free market approach. Uh, let's start with testing for the for the virus um, and what went wrong there and why we should have done something different. Great. And I, I want to clarify, I'm not a doctrinaire, only the free market. Uh, what we saw was a horrendous failure of our public bureaucracies. These are cases that Econ 101 textbooks tell you there's externalities, you know, market failures, wise governments should fix things. But our wise governments uh, did a terrible job. So uh, the market is a very much a second best, the, the worst of all possible systems, except for all of the others, as, as the saying goes. And uh, what I actually argue for is... Um, uh, markets, at least on top of government, um, let let some freedom reign. Uh, the government both does what it does, but it also forbids the rest of us from doing other things. And I think that's the real uh, damage. So um, generalities aside, let us remember what a cacophony testing was and remains uh, under the government control. Um, tests were developed very quickly. The Center for Disease Control, however, uh, not only uh, bungled its own test, refused us to use, let us use tests that had been developed elsewhere, even made it illegal for universities who know how to make tests and conduct them to conduct their own tests, putting the whole testing thing a month or two behind schedule. And the chance of handling this with competent public health, testing, tracing, isolating, then evaporated. Uh, <clears throat> the FDA continues to regulate tests, um, taking a long time to improve them. The most recent, uh, imagine how this would have gone if you could have a little paper strip test that you can take at home, costs two to five bucks. You can find out if you're sick. Your employer can use this to find out if you're sick, uh, send you home. You know who's got it, you know who doesn't. Uh, why don't we have that? Because the FDA refused to approve it, continues to refuse to approve it. The ones that has finally, after close to a year into this, let out of the barn, it does so still requiring a doctor's prescription, 50 bucks, uh, and uh, enrolling into an app. Now, by what possible right, you may ask, does the FDA not allow you to, uh, to know what's going on inside your body and not allow a company to, uh, to sell you that service? A test cannot hurt you. We can talk about medicines and vaccines. Those maybe, you know, could go wrong, but a test cannot hurt you unless you take this extraordinarily paternalistic view that you might do something bad with the information uh, that you get with the test, which is in fact the kind of uh, view that they take. So uh, how would things work in the free, now, free market would not be perfect. Uh, people have a tendency, we, we've seen people who get tests go out anyway. Uh, people might not want to pay the two to five bucks. People, you know, there's an externality. If you get tested, you need to do something unpleasant and stay home. Uh, but suppose we could have all had whatever tests we wanted. Maybe they were imperfect, maybe not. Uh, we would know what, what they're good. They're better than taking a thermometer and a web check of your systems, which is the testing we use now. That's what, we're allowed to use medieval technology. We're just not allowed to use modern technology in order to test, to isolate, and trace. So allowing uh, the market to develop tests, send them to us, even if imperfect, uh, would have been a lot better, even on top of, uh, you know, eventually the governments who say this test is certified and so forth. And I, I want to uh, close with a, there's a deep problem of bureaucratic mindset. The FDA is stuck in thalidomide, briefly, uh, briefly brought out of it by the AIDS crisis. Uh, it is, it's thinking of the test. Explain what that is. John, explain yes. what you mean by thalidomide. <laughs> thalidomide was a great disaster of a drug in the 1960s. Uh, early 1960s, when a, a drug turned out to cause birth defects and the FDA had approved it. So the FDA, when it thinks certify a test, it thinks you're in a hospital, you're sick, really sick. The doctor needs a test to know how to treat you. That test really has to be accurate and it doesn't matter if it's expensive. 
The point of the test for us is to stop the spread of the disease. There's two very different philosophies of test here. And, and for that, you don't need, you need cheap, you need quick, you know, getting a test that takes three days to come back or two weeks to come back is pointless. You need cheap, you need quick, you don't need totally accurate. We just, in stopping a, a, a disease, we just need to get the reproduction rate below one. So if one in 10 people has a false positive or false negative and goes out, that's fine. You've caught the other nine and the disease stops. So there's this bigger problem of a bureaucratic mentality that uh, both the CDC and FDA have not been able to get around. We're facing exponential growth. We need to stop the spread of a disease, not certify things for use in an individual treatment setting. I think that's a lot behind it. But market would have served us a lot better. And do you think, you know, I think a lot of the appeal of the of an inexpensive test, you summarized it with, uh, I think, test, trace, isolate. Uh, I don't sense a lot of political will among a large chunk of the population for isolate. Uh, if you go to Australia, if you're allowed to go, which is quite difficult, <laughs> But if you go to Australia, they put you in a hotel for two weeks. Uh, you have to pay for it, by the way, uh, and your food. And you're not allowed to leave the hotel room. Uh, you don't have a dog with you, so you can't pretend you have a dog to walk. The fine for leaving the room is $20,000. Now, Australia's been pretty good at keeping the disease under control. Those strictures, uh, which apply to Australian citizens mostly, by the way, returning home, not not to tourists, uh, that wouldn't be so popular in the United States. Do you think uh, that there's, if we if we if we don't think isolate and trace, which is another thing Americans don't like so much, uh, some Americans, do you think that the testing would have made a, a relatively important difference? And do you think it would the next time, given our I think, unease and dislike of trace and isolate. Yeah, um, thanks for bringing that up. The, the key is a bad habit in contemporary policy discussions of, uh, of sentences with no subject. Test, trace, and isolate. Who does the isolating? Now, uh, test, trace, and isolate is the command and control gold standard when you have a very uh, bad disease that is just beginning to break out. So if you've got Ebola or smallpox uh, breaking out in a small area, you just descend uh, doctors and public health people on it. You force people to get tested. You, you force the contact tracing and you stamp this thing out. Uh, I think it's pretty clear now that test, trace and isolate was never gonna work for the United States, given the uh, how quickly this transmits, given the asymptomatic uh, transmission, so that that uh, that would have been nice. Uh, it certainly would have been nice to start it. At least, how about testing everybody who comes in on an airplane? That's an idea. We're only a year into this, beginning to start doing. But um, I think what certainly would have helped is uh, access to testing. Uh, again, it, test, trace, and isolate is is what you do to put out the, the final embers uh, of, a, of a very dangerous disease. We needed to slow down the spread. And uh, the one thing you have to get in mind about these diseases is how nonlinear it is. If each person that gets it gives it to two people, you have exponential out of control growth. If each person gets it gives it to 0.8 people, the thing dies out on its own. Each person who gets it does not have to give it to zero people. First thing you need to understand. And second is uh, this thing is mostly spread by super spreaders. Uh, almost all of the people who get COVID give it to nobody else. And then a couple of people or a couple of events, a couple of circumstances give it to 20 or 30 other people. So we don't really need the test, trace, isolate where the implicit verb is the government. If we had had access to testing, people's own voluntary isolation and their, their uh, non-governmental association isolation. So Stanford if it had, right now, you have to get a test once a week if you want to set foot on Stanford's campus. Uh, Stanford would, of course, uh, if we had paper strip testing, would have said once a day, uh, a bar, a restaurant, businesses, airlines, uh, schools, all sorts of private organizations or even government organizations would have happily said, uh, you to set foot on, on here, you need to uh, have a current test. 
Um, and you, you know, recommend you self-isolate. And if only half of them do it, well, you've cut the reproduction rate in half. So access to testing and, and voluntary use of it uh, would have stopped this thing in its tracks uh, without the need for the kind of thing we do when there's uh, Ebola and small, smallpox. Uh, throughout this, um, the perfect has been the enemy of the best many times. Uh, you know, our, our governor, <laughs> our beloved governor in California, just allowed outdoor dining again. Well, you know, where's the science on how many of these things were spread by outdoor dining? Uh, that you know, they, they Originally, they closed the parks. Now, I, I don't remember. think there has been a single documented case of anybody getting COVID uh, from casually passing by somebody else uh, on, a par on a hiking trail in California. Uh, and that is the kind of activity that has a reproduction rate of 0. 0.00001. Uh, so it was ridiculous to try to stop that. And that breeds public resentment against all the other things. They, I was listening to the new news conference, a hilarious list of the 57 different rules, which vary county by county. I don't think anybody knows even what the rules are, let alone paying attention to them. So uh, yes, a voluntary use of tests and, uh, and access to tests, I think would have done enormous good. Uh, I think Paul Romer, who you interviewed, uh, makes a case. We would not have had a, a summer wave and not had had this fall wave. Remember, a vaccine is just a technology for stopping the spread of a disease. Testing is a technology for stopping the spread of the disease. People voluntarily want to do a lot of testing. Maybe not perfectly. Maybe they don't calibrate all the externalities the way our friends in Cambridge would if they only had their hands on the wheels. Uh, but I, it would have done enough to get the reproduction rate under one, and we wouldn't be here right now. So let's turn to vaccines. Um, one of the great triumphs, I think, of um, scientific progress, uh, an entirely new technique for generating a vaccine was, I think it took two days, <laughs> the lab time uh, back in, when, when you say I was back in January, Everyone assumes, I think, assumes you mean this this month. No, it was a year ago, January of 2020. This is, in a way, one of the most heartbreaking aspects. There, there are a number of aspects of this that, that break my heart, but this is one of them. So 2020, 12 months from when, a little over a year from when we're making this recording, and about 400,000 deaths ago, in uh, a vaccine US. in the U.S., excuse me, a vaccine was created that it turned out was incredibly safe and appears to be quite effective. Of course, it wasn't known it, it, on January of 2020 that that was the case. But what that set into motion was a formal testing process with the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, that has culminated in the marketing right now of, I think, two vaccines in the U.S., Pfizer, Moderna. I think AstraZeneca, which is being used uh, a great deal in the U.K., not sure it's legal yet in the United States. Um, and so what what went wrong there? Of course, on one level, it was a tremendous success, a mere 11 months from development to approval, which tragically, I think, is probably a record of incredible amount of speed, but it could have been better. How? It's, a, it's emergency use approval. It's not yeah. actual approval. That <laughs> takes decades. So let's let's start this by celebrating the triumph of science and, and remembering that much of our wealth comes from science, not stimulus. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good line. <laughs> and this one in particular, uh, this one in particular, the development of the mRNA vaccines, we, we, we ca it came just in time. These things didn't exist a year or two ago. In fact, it was a kind of science that was very disparaged. I remember reading they, they couldn't get funding for it because it was kind of so lowly on the scientific ladder of things. And it came out of the failure to find an AIDS vaccine. So it's not it's not all, uh, all good news, but that, you know, we, they learned so much about how not to make an AIDS vaccine that they had this thing January 21st of 2020, uh, before the WHO even admitted that we had a pandemic in hand, there was the vaccine developed in one weekend. And uh, let's be optimistic after the current snafus are all over. Uh, I There's a possibility that we look forward to the day when an inf every infectious disease can have a vaccine developed in a weekend. And <clears throat> hopefully the FDA or who's in charge of the FDA will have learned the lesson. And that mRNA vaccines after the first three or four can be regarded as so success, so sure 
that they don't need extended phase one, two, and three clinical trials in the way the flu vaccine. So the flu vaccine is changed every year and they don't do clinical trials on every variant of the flu vaccine. They just kind of know that this process is, is okay and safe. So there's the possibility that our children could face a world where uh, there will be more pandemics. They will be far worse. This was the fire drill. This was, you know, relative to historical pandemics, the death rate from this one is very small. Uh, but we could live in a world where vaccines are developed over a weekend and then rolled out the next week, uh, putting a, a stop to one of the great uh, tragedies. Okay, <clears throat> now enough for cheering science. Let's make, let's uh, say boo to bureaucracy. <laughs> so um, yes, the, the gold standard is the clinical trial. Uh, for ethical reasons, they decided that they would not allow challenge trials. People would people explain would what that is. Yeah. Explain what that is. The, you you could. So here's your problem: <clears throat> you develop a vaccine, you got to give it to some people and a control group who pretend get the vaccine and then go out, and then uh, uh, then you just have to wait to let nature see how many get it. Now the problem is most people are still being careful, so most of the people you give the vaccine to don't get exposed to the vaccine. So I'm going to make up numbers here, but let's say you give it to a thousand vaccine people, a thousand control people, only 20 or 30 of the people who you've given the vaccine to are actually exposed to the disease. So now you're, you have to see very small numbers. It takes a long time to figure it out. So uh, why don't we, you know, if, if volunteers are willing to uh, take the vaccine, you know, young, healthy people, and then go out and be exposed, uh, deliberately expose themselves so you get better numbers. Well, you could learn a lot more quickly. It's a complex ethical question, but uh, the FDA said no. We went through the full phase one, phase two, uh, safety, uh, efficacy, and so forth. And then, yes, only under an emergency youth use authorization. This would never have made it, even the year that it took. <clears throat> now, uh, vaccines are hard because sometimes they don't work, and uh, people think they're healthy. You know, again, uh, people think they're healthy, and they're, they're immune, and they're not and vaccines can harm people. Uh, so, uh, you know, how would a freer market have taken this? Um, well, certainly after the first stage when you know it's safe, uh, there is a libertarian case for let people try things that don't, we don't know if it's safe or not safe, but we don't have to go that far. You know very quickly in phase one whether this thing is, is safe. Uh, then uh, can people be allowed to take it when we still don't know exactly the efficacy? Uh, well, had that been happened, had we essentially enrolled the whole country in a clinical trial, anybody who wants it, we would have found out the safety and efficacy of this thing very quickly, uh, and we wouldn't be here. We might have had a first wave, but we wouldn't have a second wave. Uh, the FDA took a long time. It even took uh, an extra week or two. Apparently, once it had the data, why did it? It's been watching the data all along. Why wasn't it sitting there ready with the rubber stamp? Yes, go. Well, they, they took some extra time for public relations to make it look like they were really thinking hard about this so people would have, this got politicized. A lot of uh, people said, no, it's a Trump vaccine, so we can't trust that it's gonna be safe. And um, there's still AstraZeneca is uh, legal in the UK, certified in the UK. It's, uh, it's better in a way because it doesn't require uh, deep, uh, deep freezing. But there was some snafus involved with the U.S. clinical trials, and so the FDA, even though it's legal in the U.K., the U.S. FDA is not allowing it for use here. Uh, so they're going to have to go do a whole new set of clinical trials, and, and maybe once the cow is fully out of the barn, uh, horse, sorry, that's the wrong metaphor, uh, once the milk is truly spilled, the cow, horse is truly out of the barn, uh, they'll allow that to be sold in the U.S. It's, it's very cheap, uh, room temperature storage. Uh, they could just mail it to you, and you could take it. Again, this is uh, part, part of it is um, you'll see this. We'll talk in a minute about the, the uh, rationing scheme, but they're thinking about a vaccine to protect an individual. And is it safe to protect an individual from sort of an act of God disease that comes along? They're not thinking that this is a vaccine whose primary use is to stop one person from spreading it to another. But the primary use of the vaccine is not to protect you from getting it when inevitably someone sneezes on you. It's to stop the guy who's going to sneeze on you from having it in the first place to get that reproduction rate below one. And that, that's the tragedy. You know, again, uh, we, here, here there's more of an argument. A free market might have had people taking vaccines that might have hurt them until we found out that it were, you know, free market with data collection. I'm all for the government uh, collecting data and saying transparently what it knows and not. But ex post, these turns out, turned out to be extraordinarily effective. Uh, had we risked some people getting vaccines that might not have worked, 
we wouldn't be here. It would have been over by now. We'd all be vaccinated and not going back to our bars and restaurants. So instead, <clears throat> we took a long time and we have decided to distribute this uh, vaccine. If I may interject, yeah. we're not the worst. <laughs> Europe still isn't vaccinating anyone. <laughs> why? Uh, they, they haven't approved the vaccines. They don't have a rollout plan. I'm not quite sure why, but the vaccination rates in uh, in, in most of Europe are in the one, two percent. Anyway, so please go a, ahead. A, well, as of today, uh, which is the end of January, uh, the 26th, uh, Israel is the leading vaccinator with having vaccinated 44% of their population. I think the UK is around 10 and the US is around seven, high six percent. So we'll talk in a little bit if we have time and if I remember about why Israel has done so well. But uh, as you say, we're actually doing, we're the uh, tallest pygmy, uh, not quite the tallest, but one of the taller pygmies. Israel is, yeah. yeah Israel's the tallest pygmy. Can I even argue they're not even a pygmy at all? They're actually tall. Uh, but we, we have um, we have decided to distribute the vaccine, um, I think, essentially at zero price uh, to the recipients, uh, an act of purported compassion. Uh, and as uh, a result, we had to decide how to hand it out. And we decided, and this was decided, by the way, as if it was a no brainer. Uh, to give it to the people who were either thought to be the most vulnerable, that is old people, really old people, 75 and older, or, or 85 and older, and healthcare workers, uh, who who were tragically, many died in the early stages of the disease, but lately very, I th my impression is not so many. Uh, you could argue that healthcare workers deserve to have access to it. They've been suffering through emotional stress and fear of getting it. Uh, but many, of course, that I've talked to, they've been going about their lives. They have excellent uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. They have great masks. Uh, they have gowns. They know what to do to be careful. They have a system for keeping the disease away from them. And then we've given it to the elderly who have virtually no chance of spreading the disease. They are the most vulnerable, and I'll include myself in that group, in the above 65 uh, group, being 66. So, uh, the alternative would have been to give it to young people, which I, it fascinates me that there was no conversation about this. Uh, the doctors, who are increasingly the high priests of the pandemic, uh, hint, uh, or, or uh, sorry, um, uh, I can see that's, you know, I, I think, like to think we're the high priests, the economists, but we're, we don't get listened to much. It, it, it's the doctors are considered the experts because it's a medical problem. Unfortunately, the distribution of a vaccine not exactly a medical problem. It's related to a medical problem. But at any rate, uh, the idea that we might give it to young people, the vaccine, to allow them to return to normal life and have a job, uh, never really got talked about here in the United States, uh, except among a few people like me and you who blog about it or put it on Twitter. So uh, talk about your, first talk about your view on that and then make the case for why we should have, perished the thought, sold it in the marketplace. Or allow it to be sold in the marketplace. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on top of whatever the government wanted to do. So yeah, let's review quickly. So the government bought, um, one wise thing they did was the Operation Warp Speed, yep. where they bought a whole bunch of uh, doses ahead of time and ramped factories up. Well, because, it's two things. Uh, it, it, two sorry, things. sorry to interrupt, John. It's important to distinguish between this because Pfizer likes to say, we were not part of Operation Warp Speed. No, what they were part of was, I think, a four or five billion dollar advance purchase. So actually, there's two parts to it. There's There were some advanced purchase agreements, which incentivized companies to take risk because they knew they'd be able to sell it. And then the second was, I think the government actually subsidized with, with advanced money, the development. Yeah, so um, advanced purchase, uh, you know, this companies won't build until, but the reason was because the FDA can always pull the plug on you. <laughs> Correct. So did we need that $5 billion dollars did we really need the government to do that if it wasn't also the government introducing all the risk? I, I like to point out that, uh, you know, markets seem to be very willing to, to subsidize Tesla's uh, electric car ideas and Elon Musk's moonshots. Uh, $5 billion uh, uh, would have been easy venture capital to get if you knew you had the right to sell it based on the facts. And if you knew you had the right to sell it at the price the market would bear, 
uh, it is the absence of that right that caused the need for the government to, to buy the stuff. But at least they did. Um, but so what happened? The government uh, bought it and still does, bought it in a monopoly. You and I are not allowed to buy it. So the government had a monopoly on buying it, bought a bunch of doses. Uh, at least that got the production ramped up. Uh, but then uh, there was nobody around uh, to think about uh, logistics. How are we going to get it out? Uh, there was a lot of thinking about rationing schemes, about who gets it but nobody really thought about logistics. So we lost another month or two in the battle between bureaucracy, evolution, and exponential growth. Time is of the essence, let me remind you. There are, are new, evolution wants to do is, is find new variants that are resistant to vaccine. And exponential growth wants to grow exponentially. So, you know, waiting a month or two is always very dangerous. Uh, and then uh, spent all this time uh, w without really having a clue about how this was going to get from uh, factories into arms with uh, incredibly complex rationing. Not just was it a rationing scheme, an incredibly complex rationing scheme. Yes, old people first, healthcare workers first, uh, but then long, complicated schemes, including all sorts of uh, equity uh, considerations. Now, again, the basic conceptual problem was this was about protecting uh, people uh, and about transferring income not about stopping the spread of the disease. I remember hilariously, the UK's first patient was a 91-year-old woman, very charming woman. Germany's was a 101-year-old woman, again, very charming, but not very likely to go out to a bar and give it to somebody else. And in fact, uh, protectable by just having their work, healthcare workers be vaccinated or, or wear uh, PPP equipment. Um, and... <clears throat> Giving it for free is interesting. This isn't that expensive. It's two bucks, five bucks. No, you know, old people are nice, but they're not all poor. <laughs> it's not clear why people, the amounts of money that we're arguing over here are trivial compared to the five trillion dollars that our government has spent handing out checks on the uh, on the economic basis. It's totally, really funny how much of this goes around to, uh, you know, why don't old people have to pay for it? Well, we want to make it easier for them. It's about, uh, it's about, giving them access to protect them uh, without having them uh, pay for it. But uh, so I do think what would have worked here uh, was a market on top, allowing us to buy the vaccine. We have to remember the vaccine, this is not uh, a disease that will come and only the vaccine will save your life. This is a technology for not getting the disease and there's an alternative, stay home. Yep. So the vaccine- It's working is for me so far. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm still uneasy, but so far so good. Well, we are lucky that, that we can yeah. do our jobs by Zoom. Most yeah. people are not so lucky. Correct. So most people really want the vaccine as licensed to go out. It's licensed to go out. And people who got to work for a living need to go out. Now, <clears throat> you're allowed to buy it. So what happens in the first doses? Yeah, they go to people whose time out is really valuable, the CEOs, the rich, the fat cats. So, you know, for the first week or so, they pay 500 bucks to get it. And normal people say, I'll stay, spend another week at home. Then the price goes down to 50, 100 bucks. And, and employers already would love to buy this for their employees. You know, Whole Foods at 50 bucks a shot would say, yeah, I'm buying it. I'm giving it to all my employees so that they can restock it. But Whole Foods isn't allowed to make that decision. This just, even if you're just protecting people, which means even if you're buying licenses to go out, that's an economic decision. And the government's rationing rules are just not even thinking about, we're, we're buying an economic commodity. We're buying people being able to go out and earn their livings. Teachers should be getting it. And schools should be willing to pay the market price to get teachers to get it. Because teachers going back to work means kids can go to school and their parents can go back to jobs. Healthcare workers in a totally free market, of course, healthcare workers would have been first. Why? Because hospitals would have found it completely worth their while to pay whatever the price is to get their healthcare workers vaccinated to make sure they're in there. In fact, hilariously, I just read this morning, the people who make the vaccines are not allowed to give the vaccines to their own employees and are now having a big problem because their employees are getting sick and they're, they're really, they, they, they can't keep the employees working. Well, <laughs> They're, if they have a couple of boxes fall off of the back of the truck and by chance should end up in their employees' arms, they'll get sued, they'll get dragged into court. And that's an example of how rationing schemes are, are just ridiculous to the economic. If you're just going to protect people and let them economically go out, and God forbid we think about not spreading the disease. 
This is about, if you get the reproduction rate below one, if you keep one 20 something year old out of a bar, that 20 something year old doesn't give it to 50 other people, doesn't give it to Graham. So uh, there's a part of this that mystifies me a little bit, <clears throat> which is, um, let me set this up in the following way. In the early days of the, vac of the, of the pandemic, the worry was we were gonna run out of ventilators. And a friend of mine said, you know, the America, we're really good at making stuff when, when, we, when we put our mind to it. It may take us a while to get started, but once we get started, we're gonna have ventilators coming out the wazoo. And, you know, we, we do. We have, I think, there's 180,000. The, the fear that in, in the stock, in the inventory, there was this fear that hospitals would be overrun and we'd have a ventilator shortage. That never happened. They were never, at least in the first wave. And then we learned actually that ventilators are maybe not such a good idea to use all the time, early on for sure. Uh, and and so that that crisis was averted, but probably wasn't much of a crisis to avert. So then we get to the vaccine. Now, it, you'd think that having a president who had been in business, he would be sort of interested in in sort of a private sector kind of solution, like tasking FedEx to distribute the vaccine or CVS. But he didn't for whatever reason. OK, I. I that would have been interesting, politically maybe non-viable, although now it's starting to look like what we're, part of what we're going to actually do. But he didn't do that. Uh, so I'm not going to, I don't know, you know, we'll find out how much he had to do with whether of how of the distribution process. History will reveal it, maybe. But then you have this large public health bureaucracy. You have the CDC, you have Fauci, you have others. At the state level, you've got all these other folks. They have known since January. That a vaccine is coming, they do know, they really do, that it's got to go from the lab into an arm. It's not enough just to have it in the lab, which means you have to have a lot of it and you have to wait to get it to the people before, so it'll get into their arm. What the heck was going on? That's that's my first question. My second question is, right now, we ought to be spending a lot of time making people keep saying, yeah, well, you know, we'd like to go to group 1C which in my state of Maryland is people over the age of 65. And, and we did. We went there yesterday, but oh, alas, there are no vaccines. There aren't enough of them. So you're going to have to wait till we vaccinate every person over the age of 75 and every teacher and every healthcare worker, maybe. I don't, but for whatever reason, there aren't enough. Because right now we're rationing on queuing, getting onto the website, being lucky and punching in the right at the right time. It's a horrible system. Fair, because it's equally horrible for almost everyone. Uh, but like, are they, how hard are they working on getting a few more extra ones made? I mean, wouldn't you kind of want to focus on that? Like, you know, World War II, we, we were the arsenal of democracy and we had, we made as many planes and, and bullets and, and we just destroyed, we killed it. It was, it was really important and we killed it. Isn't anybody trying to like get Moderna and Pfizer to like, maybe, I don't know, are they, are they at full speed? Maybe they already are. Her Moderna expanded. That's great. But I'd want to expand a little bit more, maybe a little faster. And as you say, since we've taken out the financial incentive because they can't charge the market price for it, well, we, could you give them some money? <laughs> I'm done. Or, Your or, turn. Or let how about just <laughs> let us give them some money? You know, get get out of the way is always the first uh, uh, first um, response to this. God forbid that they do what they're talking about and invoke the Defense Production Act, uh, which, which they is the did, government, which they did for ventilators. Exactly. The last thing you need, how about let's just get out of the way and let people buy. We are not allowed to buy the vaccine, which would uh, do a lot towards incentivizing people. I don't know what the regulations are in, for you not putting up a factory that makes the vaccine. Uh, I'm going to guess that they're there. Yes. Um, well, I don't own it. They, they own it. I'm, I'm OK with them owning it. You could license it. But, they could. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. Why yeah. haven't they? I don't know. But you're not allowed. You know, you have a monopoly customer. The federal government is the only one uh, buying the vaccines. It is amazing that nobody thought about the logistical. Uh, they were so. It's very easy to sit around Washington, and drop lists of who is the most deserving. But nobody thought about the logistical questions, which, you know, we got to get flu vaccine in arms every fall. Uh, those happen. I do gather that Jeff Bezos called uh, Biden the day after the inauguration and offered Amazon services. So, maybe we'll, and, and uh, you know, our past president was a businessman, but he was a real estate developer. Good point. Which is a, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, a very different business yep, from um, supply logistics, rapid response, and so forth. But, the, the, you know, this is, uh, 
just part of the snafu that's been going on along. Let's go back to last spring, not just ventilators, masks, personal protective equipment. Uh, why a mask costs 50 cents and must cost three cents to produce. I'm talking a good N95 mask, the kind that protects you as well as protects the other person. Surgical masks, we, we ran out of those. How the hell can the most advanced industrial economy in the world with supposedly the most fl flexible production capacity run out of five cent masks uh, that, you're, that, you could, you know, that you could charge five bucks for down at CVS and make a killing? Well, they weren't properly certified. We weren't allowed to import them from China because we don't like importing things from China. China had made a lot of masks that were certified for the European Union, but not certified for the United States. Masks that are just the same, but that are certified for construction site use couldn't be used. Uh, the, and it went on to this ridiculous thing. We spent three to four months, we still are using homemade cloth masks. Just think about this in, in a pandemic that's costing the government directly $5 trillion in the economy, God knows how much more. We are using the same technology that Venice used in 1350 to combat the plague, except they had much nicer noses and funny things on top of their masks. It just Why? Obviously, because there wasn't a free market in being able to produce uh, and, and sell masks basic personal protective equipment. The same thing, thing also, by the way, uh, treatments. We, we stopped using ventilators because we discovered better treatments, but there's a whole raft of uh, treatments that have been slowed down and slow to roll out, like the antibody treatments. Yeah, hydroxychloroquine probably wasn't the best one, uh, but um, there's been a whole bunch more that are kind of languishing uh, there and not, not being used. Uh, uh, well, again, <laughs> we're all stuck in the same system. I actually saw a fascinating article that hydroxychloroquine, or however you pronounce it, yeah, sorry, <laughs> works. I don't know how to pronounce it, but but that it actually, uh, we'll put a link to it. It's an article by Norman Doidge and Tablet. I, I don't know if he's right, but it was provocative, suggesting that the clinical trials that were run that found that it actually reduced your life expectancy, which was greeted with great joy in some quarters because it showed that Trump was an idiot. Uh, that actually, those trials were not really the right test. It should have been tested earlier in the disease where it has proved to be more effective, uh, actually effective and not dangerous. Um, I hope that's not true, but I just worry that it is because, it, again, such a tragedy of uh, that could have been um, – Lives could have been well. Lives could that's have been part saved. of the larger drug testing problem that we face. Um, if you have a new drug, you're first allowed to try it on people who are going to die anyway and see if you get a miracle. Well, if the drug is only effective earlier on in the course of a disease, you're not going to pick that up that way. Yeah. Uh, but you know, going back to masks, uh, there were the federal government was uh, aggressive in preventing people from making any kind of so-called excessive profits from that from the sale of them which was a, a tragedy, obviously, because it took out any incentive to produce them at high speed by incurring the extra costs of hiring people and, and the, the input costs of the materials and so on that would have maybe been in higher demand and might have cost you more money. But certainly the puzzle for me, and this is my uh, question for you, John, is that masks weren't the only things in short supply. And, and many things remain in short supply today a year into the pandemic, as if we were living in wartime, where resources had to be devoted to tanks, and therefore washing machines are hard to get. So toilet paper was in short supply, anything made out of paper, paper towels, toilet paper, and so on. Uh, then there's a whole bunch of stay-at-home stuff that was in short supply for a long time. Bird feeders, uh, jigsaw puzzles, uh, baking equipment, anything related to baking, because a lot of people got into bread. So flour was in short supply. Uh, freezers were in short supply because people were worried they wouldn't be able to go out and they want to stock up. How do we square this with your view and my view, which I think we share, that prices prevent shortages? And one thing I think we're – there's one, one possibility is that manufacturers are afraid they'd be accused of price gouging. But I think the other more realistic case in some of these examples, not masks, but in the rest of them, is that they – a lot of manufacturers and retailers did not want to raise their prices for public relations reasons, which means we don't really have much of a free market system, if that's true. A lot of places kept the prices the same, didn't want to take advantage of people in a pandemic, which meant 
There wasn't much of it to go around. That's a different way of taking advantage of people in a pandemic, except nobody benefited from it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it is very interesting. Um, so Econ 101 says you do not screw the price system in order to transfer incomes. <laughs> because for just about everything, uh, the total amount of income isn't uh, that that uh, big and the prices allocate the resources to where they are most valuable. If you want to make sure that there's a lot of them available, that's the part of people I think often forget. They think it's like a zero sum <laughs> game. The rich will get it and then the poor didn't. That's unfair. It's not attractive for sure. But the, if you don't allow prices to change, you don't create the incentive for people to make the stuff and then no one gets it. Exactly. Uh, which is, you know, it's funny that people are complaining, oh, the pharmaceutical companies will make $10 billion off the vaccines. Please. Let them make a hundred billion, <laughs> a trillion dollars. This thing is costing us way more than that. So we we are we're killing the price system and its incentivizing role uh, in order to transfer minuscule amounts of income, uh, and um, and that's that's the difference between you know in, in World War II, uh, you need a lot of resources to build an aircraft carrier. Yep, there might be a case for the Defense Production Act, and it puts a stress on the government's finances. The amount of money we're talking about here is just chump change in, in the government's finances. Um, now, so toilet paper, let's just start with a simple one. If it, this is really your, your test for are you an economist or not? Should companies be allowed to raise the price of toilet paper or should you be allowed to resell toilet paper that you've gotten uh, during a crisis? Should, when in a hurricanes, should you be allowed to raise the price of plywood uh, when a hurricane is coming, should we be allowed to raise the price of gas when the gas isn't coming? Uh, and, and to us, this is just so obvious because, let's just review for everybody, the allocation effect. Do you really have to go? Uh, toilet paper, if you allow the price to go up, goes to the people who really need it, which is people who don't happen to have a lot of large stock already and who really got to go. Uh, it also, letting the price go up is, if you want to stop people from hoarding, they People were going down to CVS, to, to, to Costco, and, and buying yeah. truckloads full of it yeah. while they could get it. Why are they doing that? Because they know it won't be around in the future, and they think the price might be higher in the future. If it's available at 10 bucks a roll today, the same person says, eh, maybe I won't take it. I'll do my social thing. Prices guide you to the socially efficient thing. I'll, I'll just get one roll today because I know I can come back tomorrow and the price will likely be lower tomorrow. It incentivizes paper companies to make more toilet paper. It incentivizes truckers. This was perfectly clear in the, uh, in the gasoline case uh, after the hurricanes. If gas prices go up, it's worth somebody who owns a truck to put gas in the truck, drive to Manhattan and sell the gas at 20 bucks a gallon. If price is capped, then, then nobody can get it. Not even the ambulances can get it. I think so. Is this a lot of this is legis is is fear of the government, even when there isn't a price gouge. And governments made it very clear that City of New York was very aggressive about closing down bodegas who dared to charge a little more for paper product than they used to. I think there is fear that ex post attorneys general will come after you and and make a big case out of you for price gouging. It's not just public relations. But a lot of it is public relations. This is simply a fact that most of our fellow citizens don't understand. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I learned this. I was driving across the country with four children, a dog, and my mother. Uh, and we were uh, on our way to Boston. It was about 10 o'clock at night. We needed a hotel. Turned out we had driven right through Woodstock too, And there weren't any hotels around. This is before the internet. So it's hard to know if there a hotel around. So we try... Four hotels were full, were full, were full. We finally go into a, a broken down Super 8 hotel. And the guy says, yeah, I got one room left. It's $450 a night. Me, the economist says, hallelujah. Sold. Thank you. <laughs> Sold. I got four kids. I got a dog. I got a mom. Sold. And, and I'm so delighted <laughs> that you charge $450 because I know the last 10 people who came in said 450 I'd rather drive through the night. Well, it was worth it to me not to, not because I'm rich, because you know I've got four kids and, and, and a mom in the car. My mom was outraged. How <laughs> dare he charge so much? This is, and it, mom, we've got the money. We need it. If he didn't do this, we would be sleeping in the car. No way. Absolutely could she get, uh, the, three days later, she's still, that guy, he was so mean, he was charging us the money. 
as far as transfers of income, you know, 400 bucks for one night in a hotel isn't going to kill us or anyone else. It's, it's, is it worth it to you? This is kind of deeply ingrained in how people think about it when they are voting for politicians and as well as when they're thinking about companies. So there is some public relations to it. And I think that's why politicians, you know, if they stood up and say free market and toilet paper, they're, people would be mad as hell at them because why do I have to pay more than I usually have to pay? And to explain to them so that the other guy won't take it all out of the store is why you got to pay more so that someone will get on a truck and bring it to you is why you got to pay more. Uh, Politicians don't seem willing or able to explain that. So I'm going to go back to vaccines for a minute just because I think – I probably am so – in agreement with you, I, I may not have given you a hard enough time. Did, Please. So, and there is one little part I think you may have glossed over. I want to give you, I want to actually give you a hard time, which is you really would have let it be sold on the free market so poor people couldn't be vaccinated? Um, you're, you're, you're trying the can't afford, uh, yeah. Right. Poor people can't afford the toilet paper. Right, yeah. Um, but this is a vaccine. This isn't toilet paper. Toilet paper, there are substitutes. You can try to use a little bit less, scrape by, get a little, you know, wait a little longer before you need a new roll. This vaccine's a lifesaver. You're not, if you let the market solve it, you're just going to let the rich people survive. And the poor people are going to be the ones that die from the disease. The right answer, which I will not offer, is uh, it's looking like the cost per dose is, is perfectly within the range of, of even poor people. But I won't give that answer. Uh, I only argue for a free market on top of let the government buy at market prices, um, which is, you know, compared to five trillion budget deficits, nothing. Let the government buy and give it out to whoever it would like to. If the government wants to prioritize poor people, 101 year old people in nursing homes who have dementia and it wants to give it to them for free, fine. Uh, I'd like the government, in fact, to buy a bunch of at market prices, give it to homeless people. Uh, give it to people who are, you know, prisoners. wandering on the, and light prisoners. Oh my God, uh, prisoners should have been first. They forgot about that. Prisoners should have been first on the list. Uh, teachers, uh, you know, the government should be give, should be giving it to control the externality and protect the poor and the vulnerable. I only want a free market on top of that uh, because, uh, again, this is not the case. If this were a case of a disease that's going anyway and there's nothing you can do, and I'm going to save your life we might have a harder discussion. Right now, it's the case of, can you afford to stay home for another two weeks? Do you have to be one of the very first to get it? Well, it's still hard. Maybe I'm going to make up a number. Maybe that's going to cost 500 bucks. Or can you wait three weeks until it costs 50 bucks? Uh, well, that's an economic decision. And uh, and the alternative is stay home. Uh, and I'm, I'm fi- how about instead of $2,000 stimulus checks, about the dumbest idea that uh, government has ever come up with, and uh, it's a mostly Republican idea. Um, instead of a $2,000 stimulus check, how about a $2,000 stimulus voucher that you can use to get a vaccine, if you'd like? The cost for the vaccine dose is going to be way under $2,000. Or if you choose to, you can say, I'll let somebody else have the vaccine and, uh, and use that voucher to go buy, I don't know, toilet paper. <laughs> uh, so we can... The, the answer is always in economics. Uh, let the price system work, transfer incomes. Uh, usually the answer is, but we don't transfer the income. Well, right now we're transferring a bunch of incomes. So uh, let's just make that salient. The $2,000 comes with a voucher, a resaleable voucher for the vaccine. Now you've just got rid of the can't afford argument and you're back on the choose to argument. So the only problem I have with that is your use of the phrase free, uh, free market price. So right now we have two companies in America. There could be three if we let AstraZeneca produce it. There'd be three companies. Uh, that might produce enough price competition to get a low price. The lo- reason the price is low right now or that you think there's a low price, John, is partly because the government negotiated a low price. Uh, I should mention, I said I'd say something about Israel. I have not uh, told listeners yet, but I'm, I'm going to be moving to Israel soon. If you follow me on Twitter, you know it. Uh, I'm going to be president of Shalom College. I want to link up some information about that. Uh, but Israel's done very well. Um, I'm going to continue with Econ Talk, by the way, uh, for listeners uh, who who are hoping otherwise. I'd have more free time. But um, at any rate, Israel remarkably has done extremely well, partly because they have a semi-centralized but not totally centralized healthcare system. 
They're a small country, basically have four healthcare HMOs. Those HMOs basically know all their patients among those four are the, are the population. It's a small place, about 9 million people. So among uh, those four HMOs, they know all the people in the country and they just, each one, I think, got a certain amount of the, got a lot of the vaccine and knew how to find people. They had their emails. They That isn't true in the United States. So at the state level, which would, is how we've distributed it here, we've got a, just a giant mess of people trying to figure out something for the first time, creating websites. And it's just, a, it's, it's horrible here in, in Maryland. We're really ineffective and it's, it's badly done. But the other thing that happened is that I understand that Netanyahu promised Pfizer a lot of, infer, a lot of data about the people who took the vaccine which wouldn't have flown here in the United States, I don't think, quite as well. And I also understand he paid a little bit of a premium. Now, the United States government did not pay a premium uh, or whatever you want to call it. They, they picked a price, but it was relatively low. If we had lived in your world, my fear is that we would have had actually quite a high price for the vaccine because they'll have, they would have had either a monopoly or a duopoly. And you know, all the nice parts that you're talking about would have been a long time coming maybe, and eh, it would have been politically pretty hard to do. What's your thought? Well, it would have had a high price for vaccine, and it would have happened in July. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so that uh, by oh, I'd now- had them on the shelves already when the, when the thing struck. <laughs> second, this is a vaccine that took one weekend to create once you had uh, an email with the genetic code for the uh, COVID-19 in hand. Uh, so um, to the extent that it's a monopoly, the intellectual property- is only a monopoly if that's enforced. So you could, and then it was designed a little bit. So uh, creating a competitor, the, the, the bottleneck is getting FDA approval for the vaccine. The, the bottleneck is not uh, creating uh, the vaccine. The bottlenecks uh, are not about getting vaccines in arms. It's about doing the paperwork. Uh, the, um, the, it's about making sure that the wrong person doesn't get it. You have a long forms to fill out. I've seen numbers, it takes 20 person minutes to deliver one vaccine, all of it because of the paperwork. So simply, you know, uh, how about government, whoever buys it, come and get it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, you know, get it in arms. We would have had a lot more done now. In fact, um, since the rationing schemes have mostly been about protecting people uh, in nursing homes, um, it's not clear to me that the spread of the disease would be any slower if they had simply said, come and get it. And, uh, you know, and, and even now, they, you know, they, it's roadblocks in the way. Uh, Virginia on, on marginal revolution, uh, Virginia just said, nope, you can't give it in hospitals. You can only get it at county testing centers. I mean, <laughs> talk about getting in the way of vaccine distribution as opposed to just we're trying to combat a, a communicable <coughs> disease, get it in arms fast. Uh, I think that would have, you don't need to call people. So you said, yeah, Israel knows everybody's phone number. You don't need to call people and yeah, just say it's available down they here. Yeah, come, they, they, come they get had, it. Yeah, they had what they had available was well, that was a couple of pieces. Yeah, you're you're right. They didn't have to email people and say it's here. Unlike my 89 year old, my uh, 87 year old, 88 year old mom. Uh, sorry, mom, for revealing your age, but she's uh, she registered for. She lives in Alabama. She registered for the vaccine. They told her they'd call her. I'm thinking what. In 2021, you're going to call my mom. My mom does email very well, by the way. But then then her friends who had registered before her got the vaccine after her, excuse me, got the vaccine. She thought, oh, maybe they missed me. So she called me. No, no, we've got you on the list. You're twenty five hundred out of 60 something thousand of people of your age group. And she eventually got one. So she has gotten it. But what a strange thing that that's how we're distributing them. Bizarre. Uh, let's let's close Bizarre. with talk. Yeah, uh, yeah, you agree. Let's close with um, lessons learned. So we focused on a, a number of lessons about the use of pricing and innovation and incentives. Um, to me, the big issue going forward, the next one of these happens is that I think the default option is lockdown, and my impression is that lockdown has been if not ineffective, not very effective relative to its cost in human sacrifice and toll and despair and loss of dignity and education for young people. It's been, a, I think, a very expensive policy. Many people believe it was necessary. In fact, they would argue we didn't do enough of it. 
we should have done more. We should have been like fill in the blank, a country that has fewer cases than we do or fewer deaths. What are your thoughts for the next time? What are the key policy levers that we ought to be doing? One you've already identified. We should have testing available more quickly. Vaccines should be generated more quickly through incentives, distributed more quickly through incentives and so on. What about the rest of the picture? So sadly, there are the lessons you and I are learning and many other people who are sort of learning factual lessons about the failures of bureaucracy and how to handle a pandemic. Uh, there are the lessons that I think our political system is going to learn. And I think you point to the problem. Our political system takes to seems to believe that whatever we did last time and we survived is the right thing to do. And so uh, what we would recommend is an attack on the bureaucracy and making sure People did discover all sorts of regulations like Medicare won't reimburse telehealth, that those probably weren't a good idea. Nurses can't work in a state where they don't have an occupational license, probably a bad idea. I'm hoping at least we learned that some of those things uh, were pointless and don't come back, but I suspect that the forces in favor of those will come back. So yeah, the policy mix was a bureaucratic, complete snafu. Uh, really not able to make that transition from protect individuals to stop the spread of a fast communicating disease. Uh, economic lockdown and spreading vast amounts of government money all over the place, uh, while at the same time being very, uh, very uh, chintzy about a couple billion here and a couple billion there. Oh, I'm afraid that will get written as what we do next time, just as all the mistakes of 2008 got written down as uh, how we're going to handle a banking crisis forevermore in the future. And all sorts of, oh, we learned how we should reform the financial system uh, way by the wayside. I think the lockdown was particularly ineffective. I, there's enough voice in the public sphere on both sides saying that was a disastrous policy uh, that I hope we won't have to do it. <clears throat> It, it is revealing about our government that our government can control economic activity very finely, but is an, unable to control personal activity. This is not a disease that spreads by the production of GDP. This is a disease that spreads when people are in inside poorly ventilated areas talking loudly. Uh, it's a disease that spreads at parties, at uh, choir practice, at funerals. Uh, in bars, it's the only business. It's not a disease that spreads in an auto body paint shop where everybody, but we closed down the auto body paint shops. Uh, so I argued long ago for not an economic lockdown, but smart. Uh, we need a set of public health guidelines that lets the economy keep going uh, while protecting people from the disease. And again, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to get the super spreading stuff under control. As most businesses find, has worked out, you know, people, people are back on construction sites. They wear masks. They mostly work outside. They take a, you know, a great effort to ventilate. They try to test people. They see who's sick. You know, you, you can run things smart. So I, I called it the smart reopening. And, uh, I, I, you know, a much more strenuous campaign, guys, you got to stop partying. Uh, and, and it turns out masks were useful. And um, even when the government was saying they were not. So I, I think uh, economic lockdown was, uh, it was a case of the perfect being the enemy of, of the perfectly reasonable. And we, we uh, locked down enormous amounts of GDP that were not, and people's lives that were not contributing to the spread at all. You just got to get the reproduction rate under one, stop the super spreader stuff. The one thing I wish government would do a lot more of is information, uh, both spreading information and science. It's, it's, it's amazing how little we know about this disease Isn't even now. It's so frustrating to me. I, <laughs> but is that, is that just the nature of reality or do you think the government's failed to collect the data that well, they could have? The government did not collect it. So let's just start with why did we never have random sample testing? to learn where it is. You just test one out of a thousand people randomly and learn the true prevalence of a disease. Our test, all our test numbers are people who feel sick and call in and ask for a test. And then all of our tiers are based on what fraction of those are possible. Well, that, that's a completely meaningless number. So, you know, just randomly test one out of a thousand people, find out where the disease is, find, sequence them, find out which variants are spreading, give that information. When I walk into the Whole Foods in Palo Alto, how many of my neighbors are actively contagious right now? That's a number I don't know. And basic science, figure out where this thing spreads. 
does this thing spread in parks? Does it spread by touching things? Turns out probably not, but we don't really know. Uh, does it spread in grocery stores? Does indoor ventilation help? The problem with our science establishment, I think, we're largely, um, we're based on individuals who have ideas. This needs big science. It needs established, you know, the government needs to go out. If you want to test one in a thousand people in the country every week and map where it is, that's something that government-run science kind of has to do, or, or at least an enormous philanthropic thing that then has some of the tools of government to, to kind of roll out the, uh, roll, roll it out. Uh, so monitoring when it was first there, monitoring where it is, you know, which places have it, which places don't. Do we need to think about ring fencing some places and others? We just, so both the information, random testing and sequencing to know where it really is. It, it seemed like an obvious thing in February. We're not even thinking about doing it. Uh, of course, the testing and tracing effort has been a complete uh, fiasco. And the kind of big science about learning uh, how to quickly, how does the spring thing spread in? What really would, you know, why is a restaurant outside better? It's kind of hilarious. Look in Palo Alto. There's now, there were restaurants that were outside that have plastic walls <laughs> all around an indoor propane heater. Is that really better than inside where instead you've installed a, a high volume uh, air, uh, ventilation system with a HEPA filter? I don't know. Why don't we find out before we tank one third of the economy? Yeah, let's close with, I said we we're going to close, but let's close with one more thing. Um, recording this in late January of 2021, there are new variants out already. There's some worries that the vaccines might have to be modified, although there's some evidence that they seem to work against these new ones as well. But there will be other variations. There'll be another uh, virus down the road. Uh I find it extraordinary, and this is another observation about the previous administration that was so shocking. We had a president who was openly antagonistic to China, was happy to go to economic war with them over tariffs and the treatment of intellectual property, and yet he did not make a campaign issue out of the fact that the virus originated in China and that China has done everything they can to stymie attempts to understand how it spread from China and whether, where it came from within China. Uh, that the World Health Organization, which the current administration has happily rejoined instantly, uh, has been manipulated by China to not be able to explore those questions. Um, we could debate, I don't want to, whether how many lives were lost because of a failure of leadership at the in the White House or on 10 Downing Street or in, uh, in, in other capitals around the world. But China has some responsibility for this. And is no one going to hold them accountable? Is, is this just a free lunch for them? I mean, a horrible free lunch, a tragic free lunch if, if somebody cares. But shouldn't the world say to them, if you want to play with us, if we're going to have an international economy, which you desperately need, you have to play by certain rules of, of transparency? Instead, it's like, well, oh, well, I just hope there isn't another one down the road. I, I don't get that. I find that weird. What, are, what do you think? So uh, you brought up a couple of things which I'd like to uh, respond to. One is I think let's not fall into the trap of too much contemporary political discourse to regard the president as the God King uh, who's in charge of everything and knows what goes on and directs all activity. And all Con all outcomes are, are his blessing or his curse. Yes. <laughs> if if, if only... <laughs> if only the Führer knew, as the Germans kept saying in the 1930s. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not how it works. Uh, especially public health, relies on bureaucracy, on a competent state, state, state capacity, and a competent federal bureaucracy, on a competent local bureaucracy. Uh, public health is not something well directed by, uh, if you've ever been in the White House, it's just shocking how small it is, how few people there are there, and how little they actually know about how things run. Uh, you know, the, the president the, the D, you need a DMV to administer driver's license tests. You, the president can't be in charge of that. Um, so the president's job is to build a competent bureaucracy and make sure that this bureaucracy learns from its failures before the next one comes uh, and, and get that state capacity back up. And then it's also worldwide. So uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Trump on many issues, but many other countries failed uh, just as much as us. Uh, and, and it's just a mistake to look to, you know, the president, President, the president is the central focus for how do you handle a pandemic. Um, 
this is uh, uh, there is a you're lot saying, of you're saying he shouldn't be that it's a bigger question. You need leadership at the top, and you need not screwing up at the top, but uh, you need competent bureaucracy to both feed him correct information and 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 to. You know, the president can make big decisions, but uh, you know, do we approve the vaccine or not? That's not a presidential decision. Uh, how, you know, the president maybe should have said, "Actually, how do you get vaccines in arms?" is a state and, and local decision. You need a competent. The president can't say Russ Roberts's mom needs to go next in line, <laughs> <laughs> right? You need somebody who knows how to write the website and answer the phones and get those things working. And, and, but building that bureaucracy. As well as let's, you know, we had pandemic plans. We had stockpiles of masks and gowns, and they all kind of got forgotten and left to rot. So um, keeping that, because there will be another one. First, so uh, right now we're kind of in the vaccine will save us. I remember being in November uh, skeptical of that, and, and my fellow, in another podcast I do, my fellow said, Oh, no, John, you're grumpy again. It'll, it's nothing, it'll, it'll all be done by spring. And then look at the snap that we had. There will be more snafus. Uh, the un- unknowns will unknown. Uh, new variants, evolution, and exponential growth are there. Uh, the way diseases, this one has uh, reservoirs, so it, it's not going to go away, uh, certainly until the whole world is vac- vaccinated. You know, the way these things work is it goes away in the U.S. And we're all vaccinated, but it hides out somewhere else, either in animals or in other parts of the world, and then somebody flies back in and it comes back. Uh, we do not, as far as we know, this vaccine does not get permanent immunity. So, you know, within a year or two, everybody has lost their immunity. So even this one could well have several waves, if not correctly managed. There will be another one. Uh, this, you know, this is only H1N1, SARS, Ebola. You know, we're, we're in every globalized world has pandemics. Uh, respiratory seems to... You know, we, we figured out how to stop waterborne diseases, but uh, respiratory vi- uh, viruses. China is the source of this one. China has been the source of most of the other ones, too. This one is especially, it, it looks like it came out of the lab in Wuhan. Uh, now, I want to, you know, we, we don't know that, but a lot of evidence points to that, which is something that China is going to be very reluctant to admit. Uh, but the previous ones did come out of wet food markets in China or the habit of, of close contact between ducks and pigs and chickens, uh, where viruses move around and, and learn to mutate. Uh, so um, yeah, it needs a competent worldwide bureaucracy that isn't completely politicized into, uh, <laughs> into protecting China. Um, keep your eyes open, another one's coming. My guest today has been John Cochran. John, thanks for being part of EconTalk. It's always a pleasure, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.